Hello, and welcome to the Lean Focus webinar series. I'm Sue Lingua, and I head up the Lean Focus Talent Search practice. Today, I am excited to be hosting the Women in Lean Leadership panel discussion. In today's time, where women are largely underrepresented in senior executive roles, I have with me today five highly talented, capable, purpose-driven women who are lean leaders and successful executives in their field. In today's panel discussion, they will share the role continuous improvement culture has played in shaping who they are as leaders. They will share the challenges they have overcome as rising leaders in their field. You will hear insight into changes that organizations can make to improve the journey for all women who aspire to realize their potential in senior leadership roles. Before introducing you to our panel, I'm going to tell you about Lean Focus, our talent practice, and about me. At Lean Focus, we don't see ourselves as consultants. We think of ourselves as transformation partners. What makes us different is our team of Lean practitioners who have proven experience building high-performing businesses grounded in continuous improvement culture. Today, they turn their expertise to building this same expertise and our clients' organizations. Lean Focus offers complete lean business system development, leadership and cultural transformation workshops, training in lean fundamentals, and Kaizen event facilitation. I am very fortunate on our talent team to be working with a group of experienced, passionate talent professionals skilled in identifying top lean talent for those critical senior leadership transformation roles. We offer end-to-end -end search capability, interim leadership resources, lean technical support, and organization assessments to align strategy, structure, and talent. Before joining Lean Focus, I ran my own talent search firm, Higher Logic, for more than 25 years. Throughout the 1990s, my firm carved out a niche, placing top lean talent in the emerging Kaizen cultures at Jacobs Vehicle Systems and other Danaher industrial businesses. In 2019, I answered the call to help Lean Focus grow its talent search practice. In many ways, my lean journey has come full circle. And today, I work side by side with my former clients, building sustainable, continuous improvement culture in Lean Focus's client base. And now I am excited to introduce you to the Women in Lean Leadership panel. I have with me today, Stanzi Prell, Carolyn Lum, Mona Abu Sayed, Kimberly Allen, and Shanitra Moses. Thank you all for joining us. Stanzi, would you mind kicking off the introductions and share a little bit about your background? Yeah, thank you, Sue. My name is Stanzi Prell. I grew up in Germany and participated competitively in a variety of different sports as a youth. After several years on the German national ski team, I ended up receiving a scholarship to study and ski uh, in the United States. So I uh, packed my bags and moved to the United States when I was 22. I planned to stay one year. I ended up staying 23 years. Um, I went to school and after my MBA, I spent 10 years in consumer goods marketing, where back then in the 90s, lean wasn't really very um, popular or very well known on the commercial side. But I did learn a lot about fact-based decision making and good customer orientation. After that, I spent 17 years at Danaher in three different platforms. 10 of those years in the dental platform, which has since been spun off and is now an independent company named Invista. During my dental days, I held a variety of roles, including global vice president of marketing. Then I expanded my responsibilities and became general manager for Asia Pacific, and later as commercial president for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. That role also brought me back to Germany, where I 
that still live and have been for the last 10 years now. I left the corporate world at the end of 2020, and after some time to re-energize, I started my own consulting practice, and that also includes a cooperation with Lean Focus. Having been the only female in many management years or many, in, in many management meetings over many years, helping talented, motivated females progress their careers is really near and dear to my heart. Hey, I'm Carrie. Mona. Sorry. Carolyn, could you share something about yourself? Great, thanks there. Greetings from Switzerland, wherever you are. I hope you're having a great day. First of all, I'd like to say I'm very excited uh, to be here today with this audience to help share my experiences about my lean journey. And also, I'm extremely honored to be sharing the stage with this distinguished group of colleagues. So I'm not going to read through my bio. I think you can see that um, I've been given the opportunity over time to conduct my trade for over the past 30 years. And like Stanzi, my passion has always been and continues to be to drive the transformation of organization into lean ones. And we'll discuss more about the good, the bad, and the ugly over the last 30 years. Um, I've also had the chance to work with mostly huge multinational companies. Companies that are very new, companies that are over 130 years old, and I've lived in multiple no, I'm, I'm not on mute. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I've, I've been, been given the opportunity to work with many companies. And I, I noticed it in my bio, I left out one important thing that I wanted to mention. I think, you know, when people start on these journeys, there's a bug that bites you. And I wanted to mention that the bug that bit me back when I was at graduate school was working with a, a General Motors and Toyota joint venture. And I had just the most amazing and unique opportunity to work with uh, Toyota managers, really understanding not just what they did, but why they did things, and why, to me, leadership is a key theme in any of the things that you do. So uh, I'm really honored to spend the time with you guys, this inspiring group of people. I often say that life's like a book, and every chapter brings richness to the story, and I hope that our stories help you write your story. Thank you, Carolyn. Mona. Now it's my turn. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'm really excited to be here today among other women leaders. Uh, it's an honor for me. My name is Mona Abusaid, and I'm the Senior Vice President at Standard BioTools for our SBS, which are Standard BioTools Business Systems. It's our continuous improvement framework. I recently joined Life Sciences after over 24 years in the communications industry, which is in fact the beauty of Lean. It can be applied anywhere and everywhere. And uh, what I learned, you know, while I've worked, I've worked in a variety of different roles in my career from pro product management, system engineering, customer operations, and even human resources. And a common thread that I bring to the table is that I'm always, I love to solve problems. I love to connect people and collaborate and how to solve those problems in the most creative way. And that's the essence of Lean. While I officially started leading Lean Transformations halfway through my career, midway, I've always considered myself a lean leader when I look back. So when I would be presented with a new challenge, the very first thing I would do is look at what's the best way to solve this problem or if given a process, how could I do this in a better way so I could be a lot more efficient? Uh, as a matter of fact, it permeates into my personal life, everything from planning my day to organizing my kitchen or medicine cabinet, whatever it takes. So lean is a way of life for me personally and professionally. I love seeing organizations and people transform to help help themselves uh, go to Gamba, learn about what's really happening out in the real world. Um, and I have, a, I have a real passion also for coaching others. So it was during my, my career journey, I also became an executive coach and a project management professional. So I, I, uh, I love to bring all of that together to, uh, to power organizations forward. And I look forward to the webinar. Thank you so much, Mona. Kimberly. Thank you, Sue. I didn't give you much to read, but I'll try to add a bit of color to my background so we can get to know each other a little bit. My university education is in finance and business administration. My parents um, were very practical people. They thought I should get a, a very practical job. I completed my Series 7. Um, if, if you're not familiar with what that is, basically I was a fiduciary with Morgan Stanley managing investments. 
Um, but unlike Will Smith in the movie, my pursuit of happiness wound up starting in my new employee orientation at GE back in 1999, uh, even in um, Y2K times. Very exciting time to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know lean was something you could do as a career. It actually wasn't an option um, in any of your career development talks in, in high school or, or early university days. They weren't really teaching it. Um, but at GE, I learned that you could have a successful career if you had an operational excellence mindset. And what I loved, what really struck me in my heart um, and, and helped me find my calling is that it seemed formulaic. Um, and maybe that was the finance person in me but it was so simple and it was so straightforward. And I think that that formula keeps proving out. I keep testing it and it keeps proving out over time. I took the training, I did projects, I did lots of projects. I got myself invited to Kaizen. I think there were many times I'd show up to meetings with my tools and templates and annoy people, frankly, but I just kept doing it and I kept seeing things get better. Processes get better, relationships get better, uh, achieving goals getting better. And I loved that feeling. I loved doing that with other people. Um, sometimes I took on dedicated CI roles as a black belt, a master black belt, and a lean master, leading CI strategy and culture across a business. But I also took on functional leadership roles in operations, service, quality. Uh, at Microsoft, they call that eating your own dog food. I'm glad I did it. It doesn't <laughs> sound appetizing, but it's really healthy. It helps you self-reflect and make sure that what you teach you can stand behind because you can apply it and you know it works and you can bring real life examples. Every business that I've been at different places in their lean journey, um, you could look at G where GE is today and maybe say that they're at a different place in their lean journey. Um, Microsoft as a software and hardware company, a fantastic experience um, and how they approach lean and agile discipline. Um, but I think it's the challenges of going into businesses that have different levels of systems and structures around lean that have really tested me and shown me where I still need to improve as a leader and as a lean leader. Um, when I'm allowed, I love teaching masters and leadership courses. I've had the pleasure of, that, of doing that at Harriet Watt University and teachings in the companies where I've worked. I think that's another reason why I love lean culture. I'm honored to at times to be a teacher, um, but I think I'm always grateful to be a student and that's part of the journey. I can say I've had a truly rewarding career because of my lean journey, even when it was really challenging and sometimes it was really, really challenging. Today, sometimes it's really challenging. Um, my strengths are my lean technical acumen, my strategic thinking, my resilience, and my ability to tap into the strengths of others and understand their needs. Um, so I've learned a lot. I hope to share some of those learnings with you today. Kimberly, thank you for adding some uh, color there to your brief bio. And Shanitra, please. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to be here, be a part of the panel, be surrounded by a crew of amazing women who have stellar experiences and backgrounds. So about me, I'm originally from Chicago, born and raised on the South Side. However, I haven't really lived in Chicago for most of my adult life, similar to some of my peers, very industrial based background. I started as an intern at General Motors while I was an undergrad at the illustrious, historically black Tennessee State University. And from that point forward at GM, I started my career. So that is how I got introduced to Lean. And it was kind of almost happenstance. We were con con considering it continuous improvement at the time. So it wasn't like coined as Lean, but later on it was a of course, as a structure and a discipline. But that was my exposure. I got to see it firsthand at one of the first Greenfield Lean Plants for a metal fab for GM in Lansing, Michigan. So I spent over a decade in Michigan and other parts of GM. But that was my exposure. I got an opportunity to really see how you can take a methodology, a process, a management system, and incorporate it into every single thing that you do. Because as a technical electrical and computer engineer, it was weird leaving the plant going into more product development where I started to introduce continuous improvement in the business process since. And then being able to show and teach manufacturing, engineering and maintenance leaders, the value of a lean management system was huge. And that's kind of what helped me go from industry to industry. So I also had experience um, in the med device healthcare industry immediately after automotive. That was a transformation that was happening there where they wanted to implement a lot of what we had acquired as a skill and mastered into healthcare. 
And then that catapulted me from healthcare into aerospace and defense. The truth is I've been in a lot of large companies and the common theme is CI and lean. Every single stop I made, I wanted to introduce different concepts to my teams and my organizations so they can see the value. Similar to some of my other peers, my life is very lean, even how I set up my coffee maker. My, fe my fellow panelists have already heard this story. And for those of you who are watching, if you've ever heard of the Toast video, that's how my kitchen is set up. And if true lean leaders know about the Toast video. So if you have it, please Google it. It's a very antiquated video, but it's very applicable even today. Um, now, I love giving back and teaching. So currently, I'm just trying to figure out how I can pour into other people and show them the value of lean, lean management systems, similar to my peers working at GE. So it was ironic that Kimberly was right before me, and she talked about how significant GE was for her. So that's probably the common thread. A lot of us have GE as a background, but some of us also have automotive. Now, in terms of leadership, I love to pour into people and develop future leaders, especially executive leaders. I've often found that in these spaces, especially as I've navigated my lean journey, it's been very hard to see people that look like me, both as a woman and as a person of color, as a black woman. And so I want to make sure that I continue to be that example and show them that lean is a way to definitely navigate different industries and make sure that you master different skill sets, but you also drive for top tier results. And lastly, the fun thing about me, I'm an avid shoe collector. As I mentioned, I'm from Chicago, so I definitely grew up in the Jordan era. So if you want to know, yes, I have about two to 500 pair of shoes, but that's the fun fact about me. But I set my, my room up in a very lean way. It's definitely in numerical order. The ones that I use more often are first, so my shoes are FIFO too. So with that, I'm looking forward to sharing the stage with this group of dynamic women and answering questions by the group out there. And once again, I'm Shanitra Moses. Thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited to get going with our uh, panel discussion. But before we dive into the panel discussion, I'd like to thank those in the audience who took time uh, to complete our survey. Um, your input has shaped the topics that our panel will address today. We invite your questions. There will be a Q&A session at the end. And to submit your questions, please go to the chat and in the drop down, um, click on questions to staff and you can enter your questions there. Jessica and Leah, who are on our talent team, are monitoring the chat. So let's get started with our discussion. Carolyn, would love to start with you. So how important has your lean journey been to your development as a leader? And do you think a lean culture provides a better environment in which women can develop in. Very good, thank you. And I, I'm excited to have the opportunity to kick off this session. So uh, before I start, I'd like to just preface and say to me, every lean journey, if successfully done, is also a leadership journey. In fact, it, it has a lot to do with leadership and mostly. So when I define lean operational excellence and a continuous improvement journey, it should be one that touches all aspects of an organization. And I guess, as I said, especially as leaders lead. So maybe I would just like to highlight a few things in my life that, that shaped this lean journey. And I mentioned that I was working in a Toyota joint venture, which was a big turning point. You know, be, be careful what you ask for, because sometimes things that happen to you change the course of your life. I have to say that that changed the course of my life and the next series of events that happened. Because of this event, I was uh, asked to move to Austria. So, you know, I was 30 years old, I moved to Austria. I was the lean leader of a factory uh, of 3,000 people. And, and this was in the days, I remember when we were trying to work on leadership, when we were trying to convince leadership, because it's really about getting leaders to start the movement. Uh, we didn't have all these books. Today, when you walk into a bookstore, you can buy this Toyota book or this lean leadership book. And back then, we had to go back to Dr. Dr. Deming's book, which maybe some of you have seen before, Out of the Crisis. And we, we had the book club, because that was really the only thing we had back then. So we had to read Dr. Deming's book, and we talked about the 14 points for management. And that was really how we created this lean journey. So that was really way back in the old days. But, but it was uh, one of those experiences that makes you better, because it was not the easiest environment. It was automotive, it was early 90s. Um, and, we, and we really weren't so far along as a world this journey. So that was a big game changer. I think, you know, some of the people on this call have also worked at, at Danaher company. And to me, 
that was also a game changer because it wasn't the typical for me lean journey in my role. Uh, because my role wasn't to be working at one company, it was to be working with every new acquisition. And uh, that's like doing this lean transformation on steroids because every time a new company was purchased, we were deployed to the new company. So when you when you work at a company and you work with a leadership team, it's a lot different, you know, than when you're when you're moving around. So I think that was a game changer. I mean, my last engagement at Royal Phillips was not having a mothership like Danaher tell the new companies what to do, but it was really engaging a, a very old company over 130 years old that was really beginning their operational excellence journey. So that was another problem that had to be solved in a different bunch of gears in my head that had to turn a little bit different way to approach the problem. But I think we did that. And I think we started with leadership. And you know, the CEO was a strong proponent. He trusted me after a few months and we talked about observations. We made a plan to drive the leadership behaviors. And for example, we put the top 1,000 leaders through a five-day executive lean leadership training, which was not easy. And believe me, some of them were kicking and screaming to go to it, but we did it. And so, you know, I just want to say these are experiences that shaped how I drove change, overcame barriers, and eventually made a difference. And, you know, to answer the question, after practicing this with many leadership teams, I find that servant leadership is the key and it helps your development as a leader to become a servant leader. And so it, it's, it makes all these lean transformations earlier. And I cannot emphasize enough uh, the points. There was an excellent article in the Lean Focus Archive that talks about 10 leadership behaviors to foster a lean culture. So I think it's important to make sure that you're looking at these behaviors to make sure that lean organizations become more fact-based, data-driven. Um, they give equal and plentiful opportunities for anyone to shine when de demonstrating the right behaviors. So to answer the question about do lean cultures foster an environment for women to develop in, absolutely. But I think it really does create an environment for everyone uh, to flourish. So those are my two, my some of my hot tips before I pass it on to the next person. So how has my lean, lean journey helped me to be a better leader? Um, it really has helped me to see some of the key aspects that, you know, when you, when you really practice lean, just like Carolyn said, you are being a true leader and you're actually hands-on involved. And some of the key aspects that I've seen that have really helped me become a better leader is realizing how important empowerment is, how important it is to get people involved, how a natural bias for action, just getting things done and getting them done in an efficient way. Um, truly understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Why are we in business? We're in business for the customer. So if we don't first start with our customer, then you're pretty much wasting your time. Uh, going to Gemba, and this is a term that any lean leader would know very well, but again, another thing that I practiced without knowing what it was before is you want to go see what's really happening so you can actually have all the facts before you uh, facilitate problem solving. Um, it's really given me, given me the, you know, first to talk about the empowerment of people. Um, when you the best way to drive change is to empower people to drive that change and to understand why they're making that change. And so when you put the solution, put empower people, it empowers them to, to solve their own problems. Uh, I just a re very recent example, you know, we're rolling out doing currently in, a, in the middle of a, in the midst of a lean transformation and we're rolling out all the, the typical uh, lean tools and out on the shop floor. I was just doing a tour with a, with a new employee and uh, one of the other employees on the floor, shop floor said, here, come, come look at what we've done. I said, what'd you guys do? And apparently they built a new board, a new daily management board. And he was so excited to share uh, what they had done and how he felt that it drove the most, the best accountability he'd ever had. He was able to clearly articulate what he needed to solve the problem, drive accountability within the business. And he did it on his own. So again, that's a, those are just real examples that you see when you're out there. Um, it, it, it helps you solve the problems when they occur. And I have a natural bias for action in my personal life and lean is the culture which encourages that. So there's like a direct fit. So I think those are some things. Um, leadership ultimately sets the tone first and foremost. And without the support from the top, that, that just, you know, it can't be successful. And hence, even when I'm, 
when I consider, you know, when I consider moving anywhere, any, any of my roles, I'm always looking at what does the leadership think? Is this really real or is that fake lean, right? So we all hear about fake lean. Um, and, you know, you want to empower everyone at every level to solve problems from leaders to individual contributors. Um, when you do that, you, you know, you, you, you empower people, they, you give them a natural bias for action, you help them understand why they're doing it, that you, you encourage them to go to Gemba, you're giving people the tools they need to understand what they're doing, how they can solve the problem, you democratize problem solving and get closer to the root cause. So, um, and finally, it, it gives people a lot of respect. And so that's a key leadership trait is if you don't respect the people around you, you're not going to be respected either. Um, and back to, is it a great place for women? Just like Carolyn said, I think it's a great place for anyone to develop in. We always say, leave your titles at the door. And maybe we need to add the new rules. It's leave your gender at the door. I don't care <laughs> who you are. It's all about what ideas you have, what questions you ask, how you facilitate problem solving and empower people to solve their problems. Shanitra, would you like to add on? I think you're next. Thank you so much. Um, so. For me, I feel like my lean journey has definitely been, been embedded in how I've grown as a leader. So my first early exposure gave me snapshots into that portion of General Motors, but it also gave me an opportunity to see other parts of the business, which was a catalyst for me moving around quite a bit within GM. Um, had an opportunity to connect what I learned in the plant or shop floor into a lot of different spaces. So for example, when we were launching the very first ever Chevy Volt, I was bringing shop floor methodologies like daily management to a prototype build shop in Warren. People thought I was crazy, but it made sense to be able to have the visual management tools that we have. A lot of those core lean tools embedded regardless of where you are. And that was the beginning. So even like going into healthcare, it was a new for healthcare. It was called operational excellence there, but introducing and explaining to them, the whole goal is to make sure we eliminate waste and drive value out for our customers. It doesn't matter what we're building. It only matters that we're actually doing it efficiently and safely, of course. And so those were some of the things that I would say Lean helped me do to see different parts of the business as well as navigate through different industries. So every company I've, I was a part of, I've always been able to try to leave something with them in terms of my core Lean tools, even from the aspect of team building. Even aerospace and defense was very difficult and challenging in terms of adapting to the world of Lean. But one of the things I was able to teach them is the value of that team aspect where every single person has a, a place or a part to play and how they play that part to make sure that we're efficient in the way in which we run. Now, the other piece of our question is that environment for women. It's a little bit of a challenge because I have a different dynamic in that, yes, I'm a woman, but I'm a black woman in America. And so I always talk about how hard it is in general being a woman in leadership. So you have those challenges. And I think the biggest thing is to make sure that you understand the core of your business but that you also look for other women that you can bring up and bring forward. So one of the biggest things that I've tried to do when I got into a leadership role that allowed me to coach and bring and develop teams was to try to bring either a younger talent, no matter if they're the background from a diversity standpoint or a female leader, because I knew and I understood that the importance of championing and ensuring that someone got the right development is to pay it forward. Because if it wasn't for that one boss for me, who was Steven Rogers at GM back in the early 2000s, late 90s, if it wasn't for Steven giving me a chance, then I may not be where I am today. So I want to make sure that I'm the Steven slash Nietzsche for the next leadership so that when the question comes up to the, another woman, they can say, absolutely, Ling was the way in which I navigated and was able to grow my career. But it's being that for other people, as many of my peers say, when we started our career journeys, it wasn't like these books that are out now. It was Excel spreadsheets, and even before Excel, there were other options for those who don't know what life was like before Excel. But nevertheless, it's the way in which you continue to teach and drive operations excellence no matter where you are and what you do, even if it's in the purchasing realm, which, yes, I've done that too. So I always encourage. Okay, we lost audio for a second, but I think it's me now, Shanitra. Yeah, okay, okay. Oh, I saw um, audio. Okay, yep. <laughs> oh, poor, oh, poor us. Um, all I can say is I think my lean journey is imprinted in my DNA, and I, I think 
that's what true lean journeys do. They transform you as a leader. They transform teams and individuals. And then at mass, they transform an entire enterprise. I frankly can't fathom who I would be as a leader without having um, that lean mindset and having been exposed to the principles of lean. I mean, I got my role at GE because an incredible female leader invested in me. And that's the kind of leader that she was. She believed in investing in people and respect for all people. She didn't have to make that investment, but she did. And I spent the next you know, 10 years trying to prove to her that she was right to do it. Um, I developed as a lean leader because another incredible female leader, a quality and CI exec, showed me how to lead amongst leaders who didn't look or think like her. Um, and thanks, Trish. I appreciate that. She was the only female leader in really her crowd at the time. Uh, later, I saw from another female leader what transforming culture at scale really looked like and, and what it really took. And Carolyn Lum, that was you. Uh, in the next steps in my career, I, I was mentored by male leaders because, frankly, that's um, that's who's there mostly uh, at, at this level. Uh, most directors that I engage with, executives that I engage with are male leaders. Um, today, when I look around at most of my colleagues at my level are also men, so many of my peers. And in fact, I hate to say, but my team is entirely comprised of men because I cannot get female candidates for lean director roles. And that I think is a sad anecdote uh, in my region. It might be a regional challenge. But the common denominator in all the leaders that I learned from uh, and, and the environment that I developed in is that they lived the lean principles like service leadership, developing a learning culture, respect for people, continuously improving, and long-term thinking. So I think, of course, this is good for women leaders, but I think, much to Shanitra's point, we have to take ownership to help women develop in lean roles, whether we are women ourselves or, or male leaders, we need to help create some of those opportunities because certainly that's where I am, where I am today. And I wouldn't be here without those leaders investing in me and creating a culture in which I could flourish. Thanks, Kimberly. Sorry. Yeah, well, going last uh, is hard. <laughs> Trying to uh, add some new, new thoughts to the audience. But you know, I think like most uh, ladies speaking before me, um, you know, a lot of things come very natural to me. I'm naturally objective. I'm naturally data driven, results oriented, and ha have little patience for ways. So when things bug me, I, I do something about it. So to me, th this whole lean culture c comes easy, and you know, fortunately, I've, I've been a very good fit in that environment. Um, you know, as I think about these many years, uh, you know, what, what comes to mind first is that to me, a lean culture has really helped me focus on the critical few um, and, and ensure that I do deliver on the most important business objectives. But, and I think Mona mentioned it too, it really helps with communicating with the team too, right? It helps communicate with your team, other stakeholders around you, and really get the followership um, if, if you're in a leadership position. Um, similar to Kimberly, I, I've been fortunate enough to uh, a few times be put in a stretch assignment where you start out and you know you're excited that you, somebody believes in you gives you a chance, but you didn't really <laughs> know uh, how you're going to go about doing it and approaching it, and uh, you know. It, within the lean environment with having measurable goals and processes to, to work towards, towards those, it's really pretty safe and you typically have people around you that help you, you know, if, if you're coming to a standstill or, or struggling. But uh, it, it's been, most of the time it really, you know, works out sometimes faster and sometimes it takes a little bit longer. And, you know, and as I thought about maybe the the most impactful situation for me where I, I had to apply lean uh, and, and it was a very difficult situation was when I uh, moved to Europe and I succeeded my predecessor with no pre-announcement. He worked until, you know, the day before I showed up in the evening and the next morning I was there and nobody knew about it and uh, it was not an easy situation. The business wasn't performing in sales and profitability. Our customers were unhappy. Um, we had too many distributors and I took over a structure with 27 direct reports and I, I knew one of them. 
So I knew that that kind of environment wasn't working for me and I had to contemplate how I set myself up so I can get things done, but also provide opportunities for the team to further their career development. So we applied lean and strategy development, um, certainly a lot of time focusing on the organization and what structure we should have and, um, and what kind of talent we needed and the size of the team. We consolidated uh, the customers, the portfolio. So it was really everything commercially um, uh, because we had we had a lot of um, bugs to fix. So uh, you know, it took a while, but um, it uh, it really helped applying these lean principles because there was so much change affecting associates that it, it was I don't know whether it was the only way to to bring people along, um, but it certainly was was the best way to get it done. And then you know. Is lean a good environment for women? It certainly helped me. <laughs> so, and, and uh, I think for others, uh, but I think, you know, a lean culture is really helpful for anyone, not just women. It, it comes down to being a very objective, uh, fact-based environment. Um, but it's also an environment where you never run out of problems to solve. And really any associate at any level typically gets an opportunity to pick a topic they care about, put a diverse team together, and then problem solve and come up with solutions and lead that. And it typically gives people a lot of face time with management. So you, you, you know, get exposure to people above you in the organization. Uh, and that is a so much more natural way than trying to give a, you know, a, a presentation that's prefab and that may not be as an important a subject as, you know, a particular uh, problem or bug that the, that the organization is facing. So um, those were hopefully my uh, added values to the discussion. Thank you all. Thank you for your insights and sharing on this meaty topic. And our next one, Kimberly, we'll start with you. What do you think are the most significant barriers to female leadership today? Thanks, Sue. It's a, it's a really good question. It's a hard one. Um, I'm thinking about this. You may be not shocked, but I segmented these into two different categories. That's the lean person in me, maybe. So I think there are internal barriers and those are those within our own selves that result in us holding ourselves back. And then I think there are external barriers, those that are outside of ourselves that feel like we can't control them, such as being able to get a seat at the table or a chance to demonstrate our value, or even those unspoken barriers such as assumptions or beliefs others may have that make them count us out before we get a chance to demonstrate our value. The first one, internal barriers, I think we can always work to overcome. I think you have to get really comfortable in your own skin. You have to develop influencing skills and you have to manage your own brand based on your strengths, not on your weaknesses, but on your strengths. Work on your weaknesses, but really focus on what you're good at and what makes you different. And I think the second one, it, it is harder. I think you have to go for what you want and, and overcoming your own internal barriers will help you with that, but make other people tell you no. And if the answer why isn't obvious, initiate the conversation kindly, um, but have the conversation. You might learn something about yourself. You may identify a way to develop. Um, you may understand a perception about yourself that you weren't necessarily in tune. Feedback is fantastic. It's a gift. Um, or you may learn something about the other person in the process and build a bridge in which you can overcome some of those unspoken barriers or assumptions. Um, but that's the way we have to, I think, get aligned on um, overcoming uh, barriers and challenges to female leadership uh, and really transforming a culture to a, a greater stance of equality and acceptance. Um, but I think we have to lead the way. Stanzi, what do you think? Yeah, you know, as I started to think about my thoughts on this, Kimberly, I also said, wow, this is a really hard question. Um, and I actually leading up to this, uh, this discussion, I, I talked to a few people and conducted a survey to get some inputs because I know I have biases and I have, may have conscious and unconscious biases and so do probably many other people. So I think we all need to try to look at it as 
objectively as possible, even though this is really difficult, right? So, you know, similar to Kimberly, I, I think, as so I have four topics here to, to that, that I just want to bring up, and I don't have solutions to all of them, but um, the first one is, is self-confidence of women. Um, and, you know, I've seen it and, and I've heard it, but it's, it's hard to, to come across uh, as a confident decision maker, but also to be confident in just living and maneuvering in this male dominated environment. And I've been lucky enough that it comes pretty natural to me, but others that may be more introverted um, may have a more difficult time getting comfortable in that environment. And, you know, it, it, females, they, some of them may be more introverted or don't like to exaggerate, but, um, but, you know, you need to make sure you get your time at the table and get the credit where you, where you deserve it. So being confident about your experiences and your potential, I think is really important. Um, but I think there's also a fine line in coming across as confident and coming across as potentially a bit arrogant. And that line may be in a different place in different organization or in different cultures or geographies, but it is somewhere. And, and I'd encourage women to just try to find their emotional intelligence and observe the environment and see uh, you know how people are responding to them and what their impact is on others and that's hard and it may actually be helpful to find some confidants that give you feedback to to help find that right balance there uh, the second topic is uh is the fuzziest one and it's around executive press right uh it's it's a topic um probably more so in larger organizations that have spent more time on the topic of organizational development. Um, but I've heard it a lot. It's really fuzzy. And I think it's incredibly difficult to define what the heck it means. And it probably means different things to different leaders or in different organizations and in those cultures. Um, but, you know, and I've, I've heard it many times, one time, the, the, to me, a, a frustrating example was with, as a manager, when I thought one of my female direct reports was ready to get promoted, and I wasn't able to push it through to the males above me because they said she was lacking executive presence. And there are some elements of it that I think are easier to, to gauge, like followership and communication and obviously delivering results. But there are also less tangible things to executive presence to, and um, and and they're they're really hard to specify. So I think when you get that feedback, ask for that person's or that organization organization's definition of it, because uh, you know at a certain level, um, executive presence is a is a a key criteria of how senior leadership gauge your potential. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's a barrier at times, but I know it's, it's really difficult. And the, the third point I, wanna, I do want to bring up is, and I, I think it's, it's becoming less of it, but I've, al I've also seen situations where women feel like they're competing against each other. Um, and there are so few women anyway, so if those few women don't really support each other but try to compete against each other, that's really not helping anyone. And, and I really believe it's not necessary, right? If you're a talented female with potential, there's a space for everyone. Um, as Kimberly said, right, she's trying to hire females and she can't find anyone. So if you're good and motivated, you will find a place. Just try to do your best job and, um, and good things will happen. So uh, going last, obviously a lot of what I wanted was what I'm gonna say is, is covered, but I'm just gonna break it down into three key points and kind of a, bi a bias for action for what, they, what we can do about it. So number one, it's finding role models. You can go into a room, you can't find other people that look like you, whether it's uh, another female, a covering female, there aren't many other people that look like you. But that doesn't mean we can't find those role models elsewhere. There's networks, you can network with other people. LinkedIn is amazing. You know, very early in my career, that wasn't available. 
but it is now, and it's a great way to network. It's a great way to find other people, join local groups, uh, learn from others. There's so many ways you can network and, and find those role models and find examples. The second one is bias. We all have conscious and unconscious bias, and we will be encountering comments in our career that, you know, or, or things that you see. Um, I actually have had uh, a couple of examples in my career one for my direct line manager in a large group telling me that I couldn't do something because I had some kids to take care of at home. And those are awful comments, but guess what? Call it out. Don't let it happen. If it happens, be don't be afraid to speak up and call it out. Uh, we all have to be really aware of those biases that we have. And then finally, it's lack of support. And I'm not gonna blame it on the men. It's, there's, there's support for men and there's, like you said, support for women. So males, look around the room. If everyone looks like you, then you're doing something wrong. You need to get fresh perspectives that are on the table. You need to find ways to see how others may think. It's, it's very refreshing to be around a room in a room where people are thinking differently because you get a better set of ideas. And females, how can you support others? Instead of, uh, instead of only looking up to see who's pulling you up, why don't you look down to see who you can pull up with you? So that's what I'll say. Thank you. And this has been such a powerful discussion already. We are coming up on time. We have time for one last question before moving to our Q&A session, and we can then address some of the questions from our audience. So, Shanitra, if you could lead us off, what changes would improve diversity in senior leadership positions? So, this is my favorite question, because I have it at every company. And the first thing I tell my peers is to make sure that you don't just have a diverse slate, but you ensure that the interviewers are diverse. Because when you go to like career fairs, different things like that, people who are seeking to join your organization are adamantly trying to see if they can find or see themselves there. And so if I go to a career fair and if no one looks like me, whether it's they're below 5'5 five five or not, or they're from Chicago, um, if they don't fit that criteria, I may not feel like I can navigate that world. So my biggest thing is the changes are really focusing on diverse talent and not just gender roles or race. But when you have mixed gender groups, they tend to perform better at, at the top level. I was reading an article from one of my B-School um, professors about that specific study he just did. When you start looking at people from different walks of life, different countries, you'll be surprised at the dynamic results you'll get. So I encourage people, number one, when you're seeking out new candidates, make sure that you're not just thinking about the people who you feel most comfortable with. Similar to Mona's last response, if everyone at the table looks like you, you're at the wrong table. I mean, and that's the biggest thing when we start talking about improvement in diversity, because it's not just about color, it's about walks of life and different backgrounds. And ironically, all of us on this panel have a common thread and his name happens to be Larry Culp. But with that, I love Larry and his leadership skills. When you think about how can you make sure that all of us continue to be surrounded in groups like that is making sure we do this. Have these panels, engage in conversations, make sure you understand that diverse line of thought, different generations, you name it. All of those different things are what improve your results overall and ensure that you continue to navigate into leadership. These are the advices I give people that work for me, with me, and people I just want to make sure I see them thrive and shine. So ensuring that you have that diverse line of thought, because you'll be surprised when you start tapping into challenges that businesses face at the big global level, you want to ensure that someone understands the landscape of that business, whether it's from energy or healthcare or automotive. So when I say diversity, think about diverse industries, because even though all of us have Larry as a common thread, there are so many other elements about what makes us dynamic as leaders, and that's the true value of diversity. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. Very good. Thank you, Srinita. I, I can't agree with you more about, you know, adverse, diverse interview panels and a diverse pool of candidates. Uh, very interestingly enough, last week we had a, a, a senior leaders get together with our head of inclusion and diversity. Um, and I always go back to stakeholder buy-in. And she mentioned that she had a seven hour session with our executive leadership team only on the topic of inclusion and diversity. And she said, they have to get it before everybody else gets it because they have to drive it. You know, she, she spoke with, through some of the challenges and some of the biases. You know, we all have biases as so do they, but I think the, the thing that she's doing that I think is noteworthy and uh, honorable is really pushing on the leadership team to get their buy-in, to drive the message and the leadership behavior through 
the organization. So making sure there's a common understanding about diversity and leadership and pro promoting the message, not just through your comms organization, but really through the behaviors that leaders demonstrate. Uh, I think another important thing is the way we, we, you build this into your talent review, making sure that you're looking deep into your organization to make sure that you're building and identifying these inclusive and diverse talents, making sure there's a, a career road ladder for them so that they can move up successfully in the organization and probably assigning them a role model like we talked about, a role modeling is so important. So um, these are the things that I would do. Um, I see a lot of people try to do it uh, and everybody's making, everybody's smiling, right? I, every place I've been, they make a really good attempt at it. I think they try really hard. I think I still am waiting for that company to make that breakthrough, but um, you know, I think it has to do with leaders and it starts with us and, and we have to help drive that culture. And so uh, I was, we, we chuckle when we have these women get together, as you guys know, there's always some good chuckles about things that have happened to us. And, you know, I think every dialogue that we have in the future, if we talk about more of the positive chuckles than, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. You know that it starts to change. Thank you. And so we can now turn to uh, the audience. The audience does have some questions for all of you. And we'd like to begin our Q&A session. Um, you know, again, I would like to remind anyone who does have questions, we may not be able to get to all of them today. We will do our very best to get back to you in writing. So first question, this is from a senior operations leader who is attending today's discussion. He would like insight on how he can facilitate the growth of women leaders in his organization. Shanitra? Yeah, so I love this one too. So I always talk to men leaders. One of the biggest things I teach and coach is sponsorship, the importance of sponsorship and mentorship. So depending on your position in the company, I would focus on not just mentorship, but sponsorship. Is there a leader that you see that has the potential to move to your level or beyond and associate yourself with them to ensure that you not only invite them to the room, that they are invited equally with you? That is a true sponsor. But that's really how you try to navigate and breaking that mold. And I give that from a personal experience standpoint. And some of my peers said this where even your role model may not look like you. All of my manufacturing role models and sponsors look nothing like me. And it was the opportunity to be sure that someone brought me with them that didn't necessarily look like me, but that diverse talent. But that's the biggest way because I can't do it alone. Like I tell some of my B-School peers, I'm a small voice in a, a pool of 9 billion people on this globe. And so in order for us to make sure that we continue to have diversity at the right ranks, it was going to require the majority to bring people forward to ensure that you push it. Similar to what Carolyn said, we hear it, we hear it all the time and they say it all the time. But it's about action. It's the same thing with any other focus, whether it's LGBT, LGBTQ plus or not. You have to be an ally advocate and a voice and not be afraid to speak up and bring the people with you. And so that's the important, most important thing. But also making sure that you have talent at the bench. A lot of times we talk about entry level and then top execs and you don't have that middle of the road. If you are not making sure that you're cultivating ways in which employees can feel like they're included, that is going to continue to affect your diversity in the ranks as they continue to move. Sponsorship, mentorship, your pipeline. Those are the top three things I always encourage people to focus on when they're trying to ensure that they have the right level of diversity and they break the mold that their company may have seen. And as an advocate and an ally, don't be afraid, afraid to speak up. If you see something that's inappropriate, say something, because like I said, it's the majority that's really going to make the changes that we want to see in these companies. So I need my majority in this world to help me to make sure we can help the next generation. But that's how you break the mold. If you are in that majority ranks, you got to step out there and be a leader and make sure that you navigate for those that aren't. And so that's the biggest and honestly most impactful way to really break the mold at your companies. Be the voice in the change. That's really it. Thanks so much, Nitra. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add to this topic? Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to our experienced talent team, Jessica, who has been monitoring the chat. Jessica, what questions do we have from our audience? Thanks, Sue. This has been a great session so far. Um, there have been some themes and I'm just going to switch it up a little bit because this might be our last question. So while implementing lean 
what has and has not worked for you and what have you done to overcome it? And I will just kind of open that up for grabs. It might be easier on what <laughs> hasn't worked, right? That's where we, we learn. <laughs> hey, I'm Mona. happy to start. I'm happy to, to share. I think Thanks, what has worked is true sponsorship from the top, leadership being all in, uh, not forcing people down the path without showing them. So when you have leaders that are doing what they expect their, their employees to do and their associates to do, then you will start to see that change. And what doesn't work is forcing people, uh, fake lean, trying to just fill out forms to fill out forms. None of that will work. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it just, it builds resentment and drives a very bad culture when you're just trying to force it without helping people to understand. So that's just a very simple answer. I'll someone else add to that. Mona, I might add to that actually, um, similar to what you said though, I absolutely agree that leaders have to go first enthusiastically um, and you have to show that it works very quickly, almost immediately. You have to demonstrate to people that it makes a difference. Um, you have to give them a proof in the concept beyond the theory or the ideal, um, because I think then that creates pull. As you said, you can't force it. The organization and other leaders have to pull it along. They have to help pull the transformation. And if you can't use your influencing skills, if you can't motivate, if you can't inspire, if you can't tap in to uh, some of the art, I think, of lean and not just the science of lean, uh, that pull won't happen and you'll be pushing. And it, it makes for a much harder, longer journey. Yeah, I, 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 I totally have one more thought. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just really quick, you know, I agree with everything Mona and, and Kimberly said and often, Transforming to lean is a huge change for an organization, and it, it doesn't, it's not going to get done by training everyone once, right? It'll take many rounds, um, many processes, many discussions. So, you really need to let, let your guard down and connect on a personal level. And as Kimberly said, get some wins, right? Um, and not just one, but the key is to sustain, and that, that's a whole separate subject to versus getting everyone trained and, and explaining the principles. Sorry, Carolyn. No problem. I agree with what you all said. I think one of my other learnings, you know, in addition to what you guys said was be careful when you reach a certain level of maturity, because, you know, one of my, one of my greatest achievements, I think, was driving this cultural change across everyone. And Shanitra talked about, you know, getting people on a pilot. Uh, area to do. I got thousands of salespeople to do it too. But that's that's like amazing, right? If you think about this lean mindset doesn't normally translate to salespeople. But I think the other thing that's really dangerous is people get a little bit comfortable with the level where they get to. And as soon as you take your foot off the pedal, um, the culture actually can can erode rather quickly because it's fragile, right? And so when you get to a real uh, stable and, and high performing mode, you got to still make sure that the checks and balances are in place to keep it going because it can crumble uh, quickly because it, it takes years for people to take, change their behavior. And after even three to five years, I still don't think that's enough. You know, like, like Shanitra said, we all have this Larry thing in the background, right? Larry's one of those guys that just doesn't let you off the hook, right? And, and so it can happen with changes in leadership that, that the person who's got the hook doesn't have the hook anymore. And then it can quickly crumble. Well, thank you all so much. We are now one minute to closing. So I just want to thank everyone in the audience for attending. I want to extend a special thanks to our willpower panel. Mona, Kimberly, Shanitra, Carolyn, Stanzi, thank you for sharing your insights. It's been a lively discussion today, and I trust that we will have additional questions to respond to. Um, I'd also like to just remind everyone attending, if you could please complete the post-webinar survey, we really want to hear your input for those who are interested in continuing this dialogue and whatever questions you may have around this topic. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank